Hello, my name is Marcel de Jong. I'm technical team lead in North America for m and &E, and I'll be going through the Arnold workflow exercise. The following topics is what I'll cover in this exercise. Let's look at a couple of uh, pictures here. Uh, so this is the first one. It's about 600 million polys in the scene uh, that are being rendered using uh, stand-ins with a little bit of variation in uh, scale, translation, rotation. Another example where you can kind of see the, uh, the separation between the trees and the shadow casting from tree to tree through the actual alpha textures. It's a little far away for that, but uh, it's a top view as you were if you were to fly over a forest like this. A close up of the shadow casting, which is actually casting shadows through the alphas. So in the, each individual pine needle actually has a, a shadow representation somewhere. And then the last one, which is the one that I'll actually create uh, here as part of the exercise. Uh, so we'll have a surface that we place these stand-ins on and then randomize them across that surface. So with that, let's jump into the software and look at what we have. These are the three trees that I'll use to do this. And you can see that all the textures for the pine needles are sitting on cards. Usually when, you, when you're dealing with something like this, you not only have the alpha problem, but you also have a, a sorting problem. And so we introduced in one of the uh, fairly recent releases, we introduced the alpha cut transparency mode. So under uh, hardware render settings, viewport 2.0 settings, you can set this to alpha cut and you can see that it now starts to clip correctly. And it also sorts the needles correctly. So you get a proper uh, sorting from front to back that doesn't really interfere with itself. So with that, what I'd like to do is uh, throw in a light real quick. So we'll create a light and if I select physical sky, it actually creates a sky dome with a physical sky texture associated with it. So that dome sits around my scene if I want it to kind of not be there so that I don't accidentally pick it or things that are black don't really disappear against the, the backdrop. Uh, you can go to viewport and set the sky radius to zero. The light will still function exactly the way it did before. So with that, let's uh, jump into the hypershade window real quick and look at the textures that we have associated with these trees. And in this case, we get these three right here. These are the, the color textures that uh, I'm going to be manipulating or randomizing somewhat. Uh, but before I do, I want to go ahead and render this out so that we can actually dock the ARV, the Arnold render view, into the hypershade window. And with the two docked together, we can maximize this and use this UI to do all of the work that we need until we start rendering a forest. So let's uh, stop this for a second. We have the three shaders, we have the three trees, and if I were to go in and actually select the geometry, you could see the red outline around the shader tells you which shader is associated with the tree that I just picked. So the one in the middle is the shader in the middle, so that's the one I want to start with. And if I select the texture, you can see that the color offset for this is that green that uh, I see on the tree. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and sample that color to essentially store it so I can always go back to it. So with that, I can then map that with a color jitter node by selecting the Arnold tab there and then start punching in the name. And at some point, it'll actually filter down to the actual node. And if I load that node, you could see that in this case, that node has an input of white, which makes that tree makes all the pine needles render white. We can, of course, go in here and apply a texture like a volume texture to it. Uh, and that too would be a good way to introduce noise. Uh, but what I want to do is just use the color jitter node. Otherwise, you'd have to have more nodes uh, feeding into that color jitter node. So let's, um, let's drop down, or let's actually load the original green color that we had on the tree. So we're basically back to the original configuration in terms of color. If I didn't go in and maybe say, well, let's maybe lighten that up a bit. You can see how that lightens up. Or maybe go back to the original color or close to the original color. You can go to object and you can modify a color gain or a variance in, in color gain. Maybe set this to like 0.1, a fairly low value. And then maybe space out your U min and your U max values to introduce a little bit of color variation. So you can see that in this case, if I get a little closer, yeah, we get 
uh, cooler patches of pine needles and warmer patches of pine needles. And then, if, of course, if you wanted to go in, you could take the source color to which those U variations are applied and maybe shift it over more towards the warmer part of the spectrum. And you can see that now we get some browns involved as well. So that's, uh, that's a, a very simple, easy way to vary the color within your trees and the overall impression of each of these trees. So let's go ahead and uh, pick the one on the right, and that's this shader right here. If I stop my uh, IPR uh, render here real quick, I'm going to go ahead and do a Control c Control v I can then select that shader, that texture that I want to apply this to. Maybe drag and drop this in. And we're going to get the, uh, we're going to get the same result here on that tree. And if I open this up, we might want to change some of the values here, having it go to maybe something lighter. Also, maybe something uh, under object. We can make this uh, uh, gain value a little bit different. We can also shift the U. And you can see that this is becoming a little more red, or maybe I want to shift it more towards the blue part of the spectrum, something like that. So you can vary this however you need to. Uh, once you have enough variations between the trees, uh, which later on is going to mean that when the trees start mixing, you get enough variation in the forest, which really helps create a sense of depth and distance. All right, so with this, uh, obviously you can create presets for this as well, if you wanted to go ahead and store some presets for this particular node. The third tree, I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to leave it exactly as the original uh, color. And so with that, we can go ahead and uh, tear this back off. Maybe we'll stop the render here. We can close it. We can close the hypershade window. And what we need to do is actually export these trees as as files, as .as files. So with the first one selected, let's go to uh, Arnold, stand in, and export. <clears throat> and we'll export this as uh, tree one. And we'll overwrite that. And then we'll go ahead and do the same thing to the second one. We'll export this as uh, tree number two. And then with the third one, let's go ahead and export this. But let's open the dialog here first. And one of the things that you do want to make sure is turned on is export bounding box. And so what that will do is it will export the .as file. And then it will also export a file called .assTOC. And that's a representation of the bounding box. Uh, so that when you read in the .as file, the, the bounding box is drawn very quickly as well. If you don't have that, if you don't have that export bounding box turned on, you export the .as file and then bring them back in. Every time it redraws a new bounding box, it has to take a little bit of time. So if you have, you know, 10 or 20 or so, it's not that big a deal. But if you have a billion, then obviously that could be a huge problem. So make sure that's turned on. So we'll say export selection. We'll export this as th tree 03. And then we're going to start bringing them back in as stand-ins. So we can go ahead and delete these now and then say create and load the first one, create and load the second one, and the third one. And you can see that as I'm doing this, they also remember the world space positions these trees were sitting in. So let's close this and we can expose a terrain across which we want to populate this. So let's open up the uh, or expose the, the ground and with that we can turn this into a mash network. So with the three selected, I'm going to mash and open up create mash network and create an instance network, which makes it faster as well. And then with that instance network selected, we can go ahead and uh, render this into a view so we can actually see what the trees look like. Now in this case, we get three trees that are exactly the same and that's really because it's rendering ID number one. So if I wanted to be able to randomize the IDs between the three trees that are loaded into this, so you can see that if you go to the waiter value, it's set, it's set to three. If you go to distribute value, it's set to three points. So it automatically does that because I only had three objects selected. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to assign an ID node. And with that ID node, I'm going to select random and then maybe modify the random seed value. And when you select that, you can... Uh, uh, render that out and you can see that now we get three different trees actually in this case two if you change the seed value again and uh, re-render that again you might get a different configuration of trees so it all depends on what your seed value is set to so in this case you can see that they move over as well right
Um, so in this case, you can see that I get one of each. Uh, they all look good. The shadow casting is correct. It's accurate and all the detail is there. So at this point, what I'd like to do is maybe go in and um, associate this with this surface and then increase the number of repetitions that we get for each tree. So let's, uh, let's make sure that we jump into the distribute node and select the mesh preset. We can select that plane and drop that in as a, an input mesh. And it'll show up on the mesh someplace and I can simply increase the number of points. Let's set that to 1000. So with that set to a thousand, you can see that each of these trees are also oriented along the normal of where it sits, depending on where it sits on the surface. So you want to turn off calculate rotation. Everything now points vertically. And we also want to go in and maybe assign a random node. So under mash, we can go back to the waiter and open or create a random node. And with that random node, we can now introduce random values for translate rotate scale. So for random rotation, I might want to punch in 360. And by setting it to 360, it automatically understands that I want to randomize between 0 and 360. For position, maybe I want to randomize between 0 and 3. So I just give this a little bit of a value. You can see that increasing that value will increase the, the variation across translation Y. And then the last thing I want to do here is maybe give it a little bit of a variation, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, maybe for X and Z, and for Y, we'll make it a little bit bigger value. We'll scale a little bit more in Y. So once you're done with that, um, we can then go back to the distribute node and maybe uh, multiply that times 10. So we'll have 10,000 trees. Each tree is about 170,000 polys. And if I were to turn on the resolution gate here, Maybe drop this back a bit so we we're fairly close to the trees in the front and fairly, fairly far away from the trees in the back. We can then render this out to see what this looks like. So you can see that as I'm doing this, I'm starting to see uh, the variation in the forest as well as uh, the detail of all of the needles as well as the variation in rotation scale and translation. So let's stop this for a second and then maybe go back and change the illumination by selecting the light and jumping into the physical sky texture. So with that we can uh, we might want to maybe warm it up a little bit by dropping the sun in the sky to like 8, 9, 10 degrees. Let's set it to 8 degrees. And then we'll rotate it around maybe 135 degrees so it comes in from the side more or less and then maybe increase the intensity for to a value of four or five maybe a little more intense so with this configuration you can see that we are starting to see cast shadows and we're starting to see um, some contrast in the dark and the light areas in the forest and um, as it's rendering and revealing some of the detail that we, we want to see uh, I might also want to go in and uh, supply it with a little bit of a sky tint. Let's give it a little bit of a cool tint there, something like that. And then uh, re-render this. You can see that the, the sky kind of cools off a little bit, introduces more blue, and that will also introduce more blue in the ambient areas. Uh, and then, of course, you can also change the sun tint as well as the sun size, and increasing the sun size will soften the shadows as well. So I'm going to let this render and kind of recap what we did. We started off with uh, th three trees from a library, an Autodesk library, a Seek library. And they all have uh, alpha textures associated with it as well as, uh, um, uh, as well as just a regular color. And so we used a color jitter node to randomize the color for each of the trees. And then uh, did that for a couple of the trees, left one alone. And then we turned each of the trees, or exported each of the trees, if you will, to a .as file to import that again into a stand-in, which uh, will take advantage of all the optimization in, optimizations in Arnold uh, for stand-ins. It will make it render quicker. It will uh, respect all of your shaders, textures, etc. Uh, they're called shading engines inside of the .as file and it will render at its full resolution. So there are the performance and memory gains as well as the, um, uh, the interactivity that you get by sitting here and watching a forest render like this.
So that's uh, pretty much it. Thank you very much.